Hello, my name is Robin. This is the second video in the series of Philadelphia Positive Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia. I encourage you to watch video one prior to this one. My husband, Roger, was diagnosed with adult onset Philadelphia Positive Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia at the age of 58 years and seven months old. What we thought was a really bad flu ended up in an emergency room visit with a diagnosis of leukemia. Within two hours of our arrival to the emergency room, my husband was medevaced to a university hospital two hours away. I stood in shock after being told he had about eight hours to live if he didn't receive treatment. His white blood cell count was well over 250,000 and climbing. On that stormy December night, I watched the lights of that helicopter disappear into the night sky not knowing if I would ever see my husband's crystal blue eyes again. Upon his arrival to the university hospital, he was given a medication to stop the rapid progression of the leukemia. And several weeks later, we were told his complete diagnosis, Philadelphia positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia. What is Philadelphia ALL? Philadelphia positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a blood cancer. The Philadelphia gene was first discovered in the 1960s in the city of Philadelphia, which is how it got its name. It is an abnormality between chromosome 9 and chromosome 22. Chromosomes hold the genetic material in our DNA that give rise to our human characteristics. For example, these genes determine our eye color, hair color, sex, our height, and so on. We have 23 pairs of chromosome in each cell of our body. In Philadelphia positive ALL, chromosome 9 and chromosome 22 decide to swap or translocate information. In simple terms, part of each chromosome breaks off and attaches itself to the other. This translocation process was not identified until the early 1970s. This swapping abnormality creates a new gene called the BCR slash ABL gene and it is specific to this leukemia only. The BCR portion comes from chromosome 22 and the ABL portion comes from chromosome 9. This new gene is a combination of both. So to be diagnosed with this leukemia, the BCR and ABL gene had to be present in your blood when it was tested. This new gene creates a protein that is not normally found within our human DNA. This new protein interferes with the instruction that tells our cells to divide. This interference creates uncontrollable mass cell division, and this new protein signals immature white blood cells in the bone marrow to go into mass production. So simply put, baby white blood cells make babies, their babies make babies, their babies make babies, and so on, never reaching maturity to fight disease, but instead creates disease. Philadelphia positive leukemia. Now normally the bone marrow makes over 500 billion blood cells every day consisting of platelets, red blood cells, and white blood cells. Platelets help clot your blood, red blood cells deliver oxygen to every living cell in your body, and white blood cells fight infection. But when these baby immature white blood cells go into mass production, they will consume up to 100% of the bone marrow space like an overstuffed elevator, preventing red blood cells, platelets, and mature white blood cells from forming or literally attacking them and suffocating them. When the bone marrow space has been consumed, these immature white blood cells will spill out into the bloodstream, into the lymph nodes, then cross the spinal cord barrier into the brain, consuming every cavity in the body eventually killing it. It wasn't until after the 1990s that a line of medication was developed. These medications are called tyrosine kinase inhibitors or TKIs. The TKI medication enables the foreign protein from triggering the overproduction of the immature white blood cells. But unfortunately, we are told that after six months on TKI therapy, the foreign leukemia protein mutates around the disabling line of drugs and the leukemia becomes active once again. So at this time, the only cure we are told 
is a bone marrow transplant. The procedure to destroy the existing bone marrow through radiation and chemotherapy and replace it with someone else's bone marrow, preferably a sibling that has your similar blood chemistry. So what causes Philadelphia positive ALL in adults? At this time, it is only hypothesized that the genetic abnormality occurs due to exposure to a chemical called benzene, which is what my husband was exposed to, or being exposed to a large amount of radiation or a nuclear radiation fallout. After being diagnosed with Philadelphia ALL, you will immediately be put on a TKI medication and a very large dose of prednisone. My husband was started on Desatinib, that was his TKI, and 140 milligrams of prednisone a day. In the weeks that follow, you will be instructed to find a blood donor. The best choice is a sibling. With the blood chemistry being similar, the chances of rejection go down exponentially. If a sibling is not a match or not available, you will be put into the National Blood Donor Registry. And during the time a donor is being found or prepped for you, you will be able to go home and return to your normal life if your health is stable. At this time, the biggest challenge you will have is living on high doses of prednisone. High doses of prednisone create a monster. Your loved one will no longer have an inner monologue. Whatever they think, good, bad, and the ugly, will pour out of them with no thought of the repercussions or consequences. I saw my loving, kind, gentle husband turn into a mean, nasty, selfish, rude man, and he didn't care where he was when he behaved badly. At the university hospital my husband was in, there was a mandatory caregivers class that I attended. Most of the class material was wrapped around this subject. It was recommended not engage with your loved one when he or she is behaving badly. The best advice is to just listen or walk away. And after a year of walking away, I lashed out and said, I am not going to stand here and talk to the prednisone. And then I walked away. And my husband actually started laughing and then apologized. The prednisone is your worst enemy and it's your best friend. It's an enemy because it causes diabetes, mood swings, bone loss, insomnia, fatigue, lack of interest, thin skin, and nervousness. But it's your best friend because it will be the one drug that gets you out of a crisis. It will be increased and tapered down like a roller coaster ride. After bone marrow transplant, there will be many hospitalizations. During those times, the prednisone will be increased, and after you are home for a while, it will be decreased. When it is reduced, the body becomes more vulnerable, but the side effects lessen. It will be very, very frustrating. Prednisone is the first hurdle you will encounter. The next hurdle will be the induction process. Now, after you get word that a donor has been found or prepped, your bone marrow transplant will be scheduled. Prior to the transplant are several baseline tests that need to be done first. You will be scheduled for an EKG, an electrocardiogram, a chest x-ray, a PET scan, a pulmonary function test, a whole lot of blood work, a bone marrow biopsy, a lumbar puncture, a radiation consult, a dental consult and all the dental repairs need to be done prior to transplant and a date to sign the consent if you haven't already. The induction schedule goes like this. It's a countdown. Day minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, and so on. On the negative days, minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, you will receive chemotherapy to start the bone marrow cell destruction process. Day minus one is a day of rest, and I guarantee you, you will be in bed all day and do be in bed all day. On day zero, you get your whole body radiation and your new bone marrow cells, your transplant. Your second hurdle is between day minus three and day minus two. This is when the effects of the chemotherapy will rear its ugly head 
in the form of severe diarrhea and vomiting. It comes on like a class five tornado. This is when two liters of water a day begins. You can become dehydrated very easily and it will be a battle from here on out. Part of your take home instructions is to make sure you drink two liters of water a day and you will be asked at every visit if you have accomplished this. I was told many times when I asked questions regarding my husband's health and what to expect next, that every body is different. I can't say what you are to expect after the transplant, but what I do know is that it is very, a very rocky road. There are going to be a lot of good times, but there are going to be a lot of bad times too. We spent so many of the good times in worry and fear that we missed many of them. If there is one thing I can pass on to you about your future after transplant, it would be to do something fun every good day that you feel good. My husband and I used to go to the movies on $5 Tuesdays before he got sick. You could see any movie for $5, so we always made it a double feature, two movies for the price of one, two large buckets of popcorn and for the price of one, and one refill, free refill of soda. After he got sick, we learned how to go to the movies using the wheelchair. He was very weak and couldn't walk far or climb stairs, so we put our masks on and gloves and brought a lap blanket and a mason jar in case he had to go to the bathroom, and it worked great. This might sound alarming, but you will come to understand that thinking outside the box to enjoy life will become second nature. My husband hated the day I got him a wheelchair, and after staring at it for two months, he finally agreed to use it. We did grocery shopping together. He pushed the cart, and I pushed him. He was able to get out of the house and run errands with me, and it not only helped me, but it helped his mental state as well. Don't let this diagnosis confine you. If you are feeling good, go outside, go to the movies, go shopping, visit people, just be smart about it. Take sanitizers, gloves, and masks with you. I wore a mask whenever I left the home or the hospital. It is vitally important that the caregiver not get sick and I cannot stress that enough. You will get over the embarrassment of being seen like this pretty quickly. Trust me, you will. I once noticed a woman at the grocery store staring at me and I looked at her and I said, I'm not protecting you from me, but me from you. And she smiled. I've written our story, my husband's and mine, in a tell-all memoir, Shh, Breathe, a story of unconditional love. I kept a daily journal throughout the entire process from day one. It is our story and parts of it will be your story. And I can say this because we all sign the same clinical study consent form with the same protocol every participating patient must follow. And life does not stop at home. The caregiver and the patient find themselves not only dealing with the roller coaster ride of this disease, but they must deal with their lives back at home, the bills, their job, and the family dynamics. The memoir tells the whole story, good, bad, and the very ugly. In my second book, Battling Adult Philadelphia Positive Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia, The Real Fight of Philadelphia ALL, I have stripped down the mem memoir into a caregiver's guide providing tools, guidance, information to help the patient and the caregiver's journey throughout the process. It has added sections for planning ahead, tools, recipes, and ideas and treatments for ailments that come after chemotherapy and radiation treatments. It is a must read as soon as possible if this becomes your diagnosis. At the bottom of this video, I have provided my website where you can find more detailed information and information on how to purchase the books. God bless. My hugs to all of you that are going through this process. I hope this sheds some light on what to expect and I hope it was helpful to you. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening.